Um, so you mentioned in the introduction, um, of course, this is your first film, uh, and that you hadn't really seen very many films at all before, and it wasn't really, you know, a, an interest. So, um, you know, what what was it? What made you start? I don't exactly know, because I you I know I was a photographer, and I liked it very much, but there was something in the silence of photography that is, at the same time, fascinating but frustrating. And I thought, well, you know, if they could speak and if I could have music and I don't exactly know what brought me to do that. But I thought that if I make a film, it should be a shape very related to the fact that literature had changed, painting had changed, sculpture. And I, for what I knew, the movie has been just, you know, illustrating stories, illustrating books, most of them. Obviously, there were some very good and even masterpieces, but I didn't know them. But I could see that the feeling was just to illustrate when I thought it should be radical. So this is true that I was impressed by the painting I've seen a lot in the years of my youth, and literature. And there is a book, an American, uh, Wild Pounds, a fault Wild that impressed me very much because there were two stories. I'm sure you, you know that book, or the way it's, done, it's constructed with two different st stories. They don't interfere. And I remember when I wrote the book, I was absolutely impressed. Then I said, okay, they won't have me. I will read chapter one, three, five, seven, so I know the story. Then I read two, four, six, you know. I said, well, that must be a reason. So I started again to read the way it is, one, two, three, four chapters. And I was impressed how two stories will not interfere, have something, who did be the word, osmosis? Mm -hmm. Something. So I decided to do that with one uh, point common. Common point is the, the place. So the two, is happen, the two stories happen in that neighborhood called La Pointe Court. And as the real people of La Pointe Court, and as the I would say the set or the place where he was born and she never came to visit. So it's part, but they almost never meet the fishermen. So once you say hello or something. So the story are two totally different point of view. One is the, I would say, social related to work, to life, to behavior, social behavior. And the other one has private behavior, private feelings, and how it never Mix. I think it's very difficult in the life to to understand both sides and say, okay, when you are in love, you know, you don't are so excited to go to a political march. Oh, <laughs> yes. I mean, this is true. When there is a union meeting, you know, and your children are sick, I mean, you don't go, etc. Uh, and in our mind, I mean, the zapping between what we feel about what's happening in the world that we know, we, we, it's impossible not to know, but also we cannot be totally spoiled <coughs> every day by what's happening. So the, the impossibility of understanding and going with the two different aspects of life, that's what I thought would, I would do there. It, I didn't do it well, but that's what comes out, I hope. Right, I don't. I assume this is true, but I read that you had gone back for a long time to the village to show the film, um, to to go back to the to the village to show the film to the fishermen every like every ten years after oh, right. making I it. I show it in retainer, but I see them every two years. Uh, but they die little by little. This is disgusting because now very few have been part of the and in the series you showed from here to there uh, when I do the the episode about set, and I go to the point court, like I go every time, and I see in the garage photos hanging, photos of my film, and say, oh, who's that? And a man came to me and said, you don't recognize me, I was Raphael, the beautiful young man, you know. <laughs> so shame on me, but it had changed, so. Had ch I said, I'm sorry, Raphael, I'm sorry. And he said, look at that photo. This was my father, this was my uncle, this was my brother. I was mixed up, you know, and he said, oh, your memory is 
like this, you know. <laughs> and you are older than me, he said. I mean, I'm two years older than him. He said, yes, I am older than you, that's why. And it's a very nice scene because he was mad at me because I not recognized him right away. Look, between 20 years old and 85, he was allowed to change a little. <laughs> and so he got mad and we had a good laugh and I filmed that in the series. So I made a little DVD special for him so he could see the scene. I come next time to La Pointe, could bring this, and he was dead. So, you know, I have that feeling that things are dying around me. I'm, I last too long, and I would love to, which is true, I love the people to, not to die before me, because then it, it's like my past and my cinematic past is in pieces now. <laughs> well, um, no, with that, uh, on a livelier note, um, you mentioned to me earlier that you know, uh, while you were making um, this first film, like at that moment, you knew that you were going to keep making so many more films that you were in in love with the the process, the movement, and the, you know the complexity. Yeah, we never know. I never know. I didn't know really why I switched to making a movie, but writing a movie, and beautiful friends who had done shorts say, "Okay, let's try." to set it up, and I said, why not? And then we tried. And then we did a very small crew, we were seven, you know, and he was doing uh, production managing, but he was pushing the, the rail, the, the chariot, c'est pas, what goes on the trail. And she was doing not only continuity, but she was packing the film and going to the station to send them to the lab, you know. Everybody was doing three jobs in a way, and and we had very little money. We rented one house. We all lived there. We gave the good room to, to the two actors because Philippe Noiret, it was his first film and he was already in the theater. And she had done a film with Jean Cocteau, L'Aigle à deux têtes. And she was an actress. No, we gave them, each of them, the two master rooms, I would say. And then, and the DP had his wife, so there were three rooms, okay. And the other one were two by two, two by two, and I was in the garage. I set a little. <laughs> something, and I put a untie musicals and, comment on dit les, uh, c'est pas des lézards, but the tout petits lézards, the, the quoi? Huh? The petits salamandes. So I put a veil, like a wedding thing, and I would do it around my mattress, so I would oh. escape from the little <laughs> animal going around. Yeah. So it was a very, and we didn't go to restaurant, we didn't get them the per day, there was a woman cooking for us at night. No discussion, that's all we had to eat. <laughs> and at lunch, time, you know, I know actor and technician now. They want, which is normal, they want a pair day, they want a real entrance, plat, cheese, dessert. So, and they want to have that good night, good hotel. And it was so nice to accept that. Bienvenida, the one who is the mother of Ulysses, a short I made. She was cooking, and at lunch we had sandwiches in the La Pointe Courte. So sometimes we would find a hut to put ourselves, but sometimes in the cell. So uh, it was so nice to do something with friends. I didn't realize it was a very difficult situation. And then what? We wanted the film, nobody. So there was a very good, well, I didn't know where to go. I knew nobody in the business, not even. A, so André Bazin, who was a wonderful writer, no, people who know about cinema writing, and André Bazin, because I have an editor who was not so well known but at the time, Alain René. Yeah. <laughs> Alain René, uh, was, he was an editor. Yeah. How did you meet him or how, how I did that I wrote him a letter. Yeah. And I said, Monsieur René, I heard that you are a good editor and you have feelings for the left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent, perfect. I wrote that <laughs> and said, would you like to come and see? I made a film. And he said, okay, I come to the lab, because at the lab you don't pay the screening. Mm -hmm. So we went to the lab, north of Paris, and he's very strict. He always like he's, he has been always like very correct and strict. Mm -hmm. And so we go to the lab, he sit in the middle, and I sit behind, and I dare to say, well, you know, it's silent. You want me to tell you the words? No, no, no. So we go, you know, I had nine hours of shoots, of, of rushes. So he sat, no, nothing, not a word. And after like two or three hours, he said, okay, thank you, I think I've seen enough. He stood, and I say, 
I drive you home? He said, yes. Didn't say a word. I felt <laughs> he said, maybe I take the metro. So I took the metro. I said, what is this story? And then he called me and said, this is very interesting, but it's so near some research I do that I should not work on that. I'm sorry. Mm. I was sorry. Because when he, when he had said that in the room, I was in the back, I cried. I said, oh God, this is a bad beginning. And a week later, he said, what are you about to say to do? I said, nothing. And he said, I can't, you know, there is something you have to do with. Stuck, stuck, you said. You have to write to recognize the foot. You know, you have a little machine like this, it turns. And every, chaque pied, every foot, mm -hmm. you write, you know, take 30. Mm -hmm. uh, shot 30, take one. Uh, 30, take one, two. So I did that, you know. And he gave me something to put the reels and a little machine like this. And he said, anyway, what happens, you will need that in the editing. So I said, okay. So I put all the reels, I started to put the reel. You know, have you seen that? It's a little trick. You turn like this, and you write. I, I bought the right pen, the right ink, and I started to write. And I did that, only that, day and almost night, thought, if it's the beginning, I'll do it. So I called him 10 days later. I say, Alain, it's Agnès, uh, I did what you said. He said, what? But I say, I wrote the, he say, all of them? I say, yes. He say, you're crazy, I'll do the editing. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it started. And I rented a machine and he came, same place that I'm always like, you've seen in the beach of Agnès, that little courtyard. Mm -hmm. And I rented the machine. I rented something, and he came. He would come every day, and, and he said, I, I accept not to be paid. You have to pay for my lunch. So every day I gave him, I don't know, 10, 10 francs or 20 francs for lunch. He would come back at 2 and leave at 6. Very precise and did beautiful work. He explained me a lot of things. I knew nothing about cinema. I said, you know, this reminds me. There are tram at the Visconti. He said, who's Visconti? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. Yeah. He <laughs> said, there is a very wonderful director called Orson Welles, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> etc. So I mean, I knew nothing, nothing. And he said, have you been to the cinematic? I didn't know where it was. He said, I've not seen. You have to see some film. I said, give me a list. So he sent me first thing I went to see was Vampire de Dreyer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> something. And he wrote me and I would go sometimes to see film. And little by little I got mm -hmm the disease, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I start to, to love films. Um, I think there are probably a lot of questions. But this is, you know, it's like history for me because it's the beginning of my history because the minute I did the first shot, as I said, I said, well, this is what I want to do. I will be, I am already a filmmaker. That was it. And then I, I, I couldn't make films easily because, you know, Bazin, as I told you, say you have to show the film at Cannes to whom? So my mother paid a screening in a private theater, sans, sans France Côté. And Bazin gave me names that I should invite. And I went hotel to hotel, deposit the invitation that he took. And he wrote something in the film français. He wrote something, a, a, a film pur et dur. Pure and dur, something. And 40 people came. Among them, some two or three critics, two people theaters. And that was in 55, May 55. Festival de Cannes was a very small festival. Incredibly few films and nice and open. And just to say, those who go now, I know what I'm speaking about. It's a t totally different scene. Yeah. So after that, I thought something will happen. Nothing happened. So this is 55, and in 56, a man in Paris who had a small theater, very sophisticated cinephile theater, a studio Parnasse in a little corner, say, I take the film two weeks. And he took the film two weeks, and we invited whatever you, you knew. And I was in the booth, you know, the first opening, I went to the booth and tried to listen, and uh, there was a discussion. And I could see, you know, people, Marguerite Duras was there, Nathalie Sarraud, Chris <coughs> Marker, Truffaut, all the people who I heard about the film came. And there was a discussion at the, after the film. And I was still listening, you know, very curious to say. And Marker said something about the scene. He said, 
you have to understand she's dealing with material. She's the woman is related to metal and is related to wood. My heart started to beat because that's what I had thought. But I thought she should never express that, never say it. And Marke had pointed it to her. And Truffaut was in the room and said, this is fake. She <laughs> must, she, he must have put the bed standing. I don't know why he thought I'd wait up for the bed like this. Then. <laughs> so why he had that in mind? And when he wrote about the film, was, he said, La Pointe Seche, not La Pointe Courte, would be the dry point, you know. Maybe a mistake of printing, who knows? <laughs> and, but two years later, he wrote again and said, I think I mistake myself. I was, I didn't get the film. Oh, okay. No, it, it came back to it. Some other also did. But you know, at that time, it was incredible. So, in that little cinema, e every Tuesday would do Q and A. Mm -hmm. So for the two weeks, we had two Q and A evenings, and that was it. After the two weeks, that's a big distribution. So it came some screening in Switzerland, ten screening here and there too. I was invited here and there. So I think in 60 years, it's six, yeah, in 60 years, I think the film piled up maybe 20,000 people in 60 years. Very little, but it has not been forgotten. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with success. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to say it. But I know people who know that film and speak about it and teach it. And I was glad then when Criterion, Criterion did the first book, Box, they took a point court, yeah. Vagabond, Jacques de Nantes, and Cléo. Yeah, yeah. So it was the first time there was a DVD of the film. Yeah. So you have seen something which is rare. <laughs> Enjoy it. <Yeah. laughs> okay, we can try to open it up. Who's ready? Yes, sir. Let me let me yeah let me distill that briefly. Um, <laughs> the first the first main question is just about sort of uh, literary influences, and the second is about um, other sort of sorts of juxtaposition um, between sort of between image and text in the film. Um, there is the obvious juxtaposition of the two stories um, and uh, the sort of different worlds that the parallel stories embody. Um, but he's also talking about um, sort of you know is uh, the world of image versus text. <laughs> I don't know what I have to answer. But it was like a <laughs> declaration about the film and the way you felt it. Then thank you. But what I know is that I tried with the fishermen. I had met them very often, and at the time I didn't have a little recording machine, so I would listen to their story and come home and write down some of their way of speaking. So I wrote their dialogue. It's not a report, it's not documentary, you know, because the family are all totally recast. And you know, the mother, the daughter is not the, the daughter of the real, you know. They accepted to play. And also the, um, didn't you, the, the sound was, was um, recorded later, right? That's, that's, that's the question is, because uh, they were speaking normally, but. We didn't have the money to record the song. I didn't have a recording machine to get the real way of speaking. But later, when we made the film, it was too expensive to have the sound system and to have somebody to do the sound. So we, sh as I said when I showed it to René, it was silent shooting. So the problem was later 
to, because I wrote their language, but it was really the way they spoke. But they, but I asked them to say their own words. It's a kind of, uh, well, I built their story with different people of the village there. And later we had to do the dubbing, but I could not take them to Paris, or I couldn't take a recording system in the city, and it's very difficult to be in sync, you know, it's not so easy. So we made it with people in Paris from the south having more or less the same accent. But not bad, it's not too bad, but it's not good. <laughs> but you see, it's not like the direct sound, obviously. But when we show the film, because I show the film to the people of the Pointe Court, this is every 10 years I make this. Well, you know, 66 times since I did it. And we show it, and so they bring their kids, their family, and they say, oh, that was my mother, that was my cousin. But they c complain, because it's not their own voice, you know, it's, it's not their own voices. It looks not too bad, but it's not their voices, so they say, you know, putain, you could have gi given us a... <laughs> and I say, putain, putain, I couldn't make, I couldn't have the sound, I'm sorry. But still, and they, they like it, they're proud of the film, you know. But you see, so I, am I answering? I really wanted a very different tune, tune in, the, in the part of the fishermen and the literary voices. I mean, they speak well, and I made a very specific way of speaking. It's not even natural, but I wanted this to express feelings about separation or not, that time where it's so difficult in couples, you know. And then, I use images for the fishermen. I do natural shooting, I would say, with some tricks, you know, like the, some technical nice things. But for the couple, I try to have them, uh, oh, it's difficult to explain. I refuse the sound perspective, which is normal, you know, when, sh when people go away, you know, they go away like this, and then they come back, and come back, like in singing the rain, you know, what? Uh, uh, uh. So, I thought I should have no perspective at all. They speak near the screen, and whatever they are back there in the landscape or here. So it, it made a con it's like a dialogue. It's not even you know a, a real conversation. But then, because it was so act, you know, they did so well. They did, and I try to have images, sometimes heavy, but look allegoric, you know, uh, sort of response to what they say. So, you know, sometimes you may notice that some images correspond more or less before or after to what they feel or what it is. And one I love so much is the sitting here discussing does he suffer more and she suffer more. And you have in the back these cats, you know, and <laughs> grab, grab, grabbing the wood, you know, and enraged cats. And I thought that beautiful that I was helped by that, even yeah. though I love the cats, but I tried to get them there. But then they did something like when you scribe your commandi on the deaf ear. You say that people do that to themselves when they yeah. speak. So I tried to have images that would uh, load the feeling that they express. Well, uh, that was my way of felt about the, the black goudron. Is it tar, far? Come on, I put it. Far, yeah. You know, and at that time, all the fishermen nets were white and it would dye them. Yeah. And I like that image because it's so impressive that the white becomes suddenly black and disgusting. And, and so I use it when they look, this is a mirror for her. But then when the child is dead, this is something that, is, I, I had the ideas about that. Image uh, are load, loaded with feelings. Image means something, which I don't believe so much now. But at that time, I thought I should use images as a way of language. I guess it shows here and there. Can I ask why you don't believe that now? You said you don't believe that now. Because I even made a film called Ulysse, and I said whatever you add to an image, you load the image with the way you look at it, with your own memory or cult or whatever, and you can, I made a film about that. You can remember what happened when you did that image. What, what was the surrounding? What was the situation? How do you, and at some point, Whatever you say, the image just represents represent what it is. Imagine a chair, it's just a chair. 
And I think what we see, that's why it's so important, the viewer. That's why many artists say that the viewer is part of the art. Because the way you look at it, the way you, you put your own vision into a photo, photography or into a film, it's your problem. It, the image is like nothing, just representing. That's what I think now. At the time, I thought I could use image as like part of the language. Look. That was it was. I was impressed that Barker noticed it, but it is true, she is really, come on, the grinçante. Uh, grinçante, I don't know the word. But you see, when they meet that sort of train that is in the suburb, and like, <coughs> that's what she does in a way, you know. She sounds like the train, the old train, but this is true. And that's why I related her to this. She come by train and she's, you know, not, not nice, you know, she's not, she, she wants to discuss, she's really, she's not adapted to what she sees, and he has to bring her slowly. That's why he finds this rotten boat, abandoned boat, and they go inside like, like a nest, a wood nest, I think. He believes very much because his father was there working as a mm, marine carpenter, boat carpenter, carpenter. And he has known that all his life, and and he, he thought that she would s calm down and s smooth herself by discovering that <coughs> surrounding, peaceful and related to wood. Was that a question, was I conscious? Yes, I was. But maybe I showed it very heavily, but I was certainly conscious of that we, we don't have been, I was not a student of anything, but I followed the, the course of philosophy of, uh, Bachelard, Gaston Bachelard. And he had made psychoanalysis of elements. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing I understood in his teaching, because sometimes he was a epistemologist, I don't know how he said that. But what he spoke about material and things that are related to, to our souls, our spirit, whatever, he, he, he was so important that I could express that in films, dealing with reality and dealing with art. My passion for cats? Yeah. Well, this is very <laughs> common. M many people love cats. <laughs> and many poets have been loving cats. But I always had cats around me since I was alone. Not at home. I never had animals at my place. But I started with cats and two cats and many cats. And some of our cats were better than others or sweeter. And it was a cat I loved so much. And Jacques de Bee loved also. And the cat has been good to us. And the cat was name was Gugu. <laughs> and as you may know, I have a third life. So in the last 10 years, I do installation. I work in video things. I expose in museums, in galleries. And among the things I did for La Fondation Cartier, I did the grave, uh, le, la tombeau de ce gougou, the, the grave of ce gougou. And it's a film in which the real grave, because that poor guy died, and my son did a little something like this, and I started to make an animation film. And, you know, it's a lot of nice shell come on the grave and then flowers, paper flower. It becomes a beautiful thing. And Larry Kardish that I saw is in the room, he wrote a piece about that for the catalogue of La Fondation Cartier. As if, you know, sometimes in a side work, you express my love for uh, finding a way to express something. It's not enough to say, I lose my cat. I made him a grave. And you know, the thing is that uh, I was using very primary animation. We know what they do now with special effects. It's incredibly beautiful. But I did it really with the old-fashioned thing that 
I put all the shells. And then I do a shot, I take a shell out. I do a shot, I take a second shell out. So it takes a whole day to do. But then you reverse the thing and you see the shells coming in. So this is like the first level of animation, which I love to do, I love to do. And so that gravius had been shown in many museums. So that's by part of in cat culture. I assume you and, you and Marker talked about cats every now and then? Uh, you and Chris Marker bonded over cats? Yes, we had that in common with Chris Marker, <laughs> very bright filmmaker and very interesting man. And I, I was the only one who shot something in his studio because he didn't want any photo, any filming for 20 years. And since I was a friend, he allowed me to film the disorder of his studio and listening to him and I see his hands, but didn't allow me to show his face, but coquette in a way. <laughs> but such a bright man. Yes, because we have to be natural whatever we are. It's difficult sometimes to accept, but that's what it is. And it was, uh, until the end, you know, he worked, he had ideas about everything. And he was living in the second life on internet. I, I, some of you are, have avatar in second lives, because he had, and because I wanted to join him there. Student, French student who had been at Galatz and knew how to do that. She made me enter in the, in the second life of Marquet and dance, you know, a little with a cat, because he had a cat representing him called Guillaume en Egypte. And he didn't want to give interview, so he was always supposed to be Guillaume answering. You know, that's why he <laughs> But I loved him the way he was, complicated and very bright and working until the end. So I guess you, you love La Jetée. Everybody loves La Jetée. <laughs> but Sans Soleil and other films, and he has made beautiful documentaries, really. And we shared the desire of adding narration to the documentary, because I admire very much people like Wise Man, you know, they let it go, and, and they don't interfere at all. It's one way, of we and we thought that we can just push, you know, the the game so that people will get maybe more or in a different way, and, and we polish our docu um, narration very much. And I did it in editing room, and then I would record and say, no, I have to change the editing. I would change the editing, then I have to change the narration. And so the editing is very long, whatever I do, but I love the editing. It's part of the cine writing, as I say. Okay, we can take one more. Better be good. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, how much chance did you take into the film? So, like the carcass of the cat floating, and, um, like the pregnant cat. Um, is that something that you saw and then started filming it? Um, w how many? How, how much um, of the um, of the landscape was left to chance, and how many? of sort of the, the landscape in the film, for instance, the dead cat in the water and um, things like that. How many things did you place or how much was just the, you know, what was there by accident? I don't know. I take advantage of whatever is presented to me by chance, but also I had ideas. I had taken a picture before going to La Pointe Court. That's the film I prepared very well because at the time I didn't know what I would do. So later I didn't do this kind of storyboard, but at that time I did storyboard with photos and very precise where I would cut, or how we would do it. And, and, but obviously I took advantage, I had prepared, and I try in other films to always grab what is proposed by chance. But the question was how much, because the landscape are so important for me, you know, my say when I started the Plage d'Agnès, I said, you know, we all have landscape in ourselves. And if you open me, I have beaches. And I ask sometimes, if we had time, I would ask you, what is the landscape if I open you? And this is true that we are fed, our soul and our eye is fed with landscape or special and details in the landscape that stay with us, that's the way I feel it. So I'm very interested in documentaries or in fiction to, to know that we are connection with a landscape or a new landscape or something we go. And the here and now and there, now the here and now is related to look carefully of where we are and does it make sense for us to be to be there not elsewhere it's, it's, it's very interesting for me when I do documentaries to be attentive, attentive to 
really where it is and what it is and how, we s how it smells and how it looks and is there wind or not, etc. So in the point court, I really care about the sun being so strong because I thought so much sun is cruel. And when a couple discuss like this with the intensive light, I think it's like being naked in a way, you know, well, the spirit, the souls, whatever. And, and so it's a life that's where they live, the others. And the fish, the f no, I don't want to go into that, but the, the when they were disturbed because somebody said the, f the, the clams, they were fishing with not in good water. And so in the story they do a counter, uh, so a counter analysis because they said, uh, and because I said you have to put yourself, and that's in the film. But I was very proud because after the film, they really did a kind of union, and they really did counter analysis, and they, and they won, and they, they could not be tormented about that. I, I was glad that I did something in my screenplay of their group that became obvious for them, and they did it really. So I, I was happy about that. Thank you so much. Um.